So as you can see here, um, we have um, a very large subdural hematoma, and this is a very severely injured patient because there's also uh, intraparenchymal uh, spot uh, hemorrhages here. And that indicates a very severe injury, lots of underlying brain damage, as well as the compressive lesion that's causing a tremendous amount of shift. So my goal over the course of the last 20 odd years is to try to help people get better so that they recover. It would be wonderful if everybody was able to get back to work and, and become productive members of society again, uh, as they were previous to the injury. But alas, I don't think we've gotten there um, for severe uh, traumatic brain injury. While the mortality rates are generally about 25%, uh, we do, and we have made a lot of strides in severe TBI, uh, we still have a long way to go in trying to make the outcomes optimal so that we can return patients to uh, something of a semblance of their previous level of functioning. Most of these patients, unfortunately, are coming back to some sort of new type normal that the families have to deal with, but many families are very grateful if they do survive and are functional, able, grateful for having them uh, come back to them. Decompressive craniectomy has been a um, method of treatment for severe uh, intracranial hypertension. And now it's been going on for many, many years. It was actually first described in uh, 1901 by Dr. Coker. And it became more popular in the 1960s. So that's why I say there's sort of a biphase of use. So in the 1960s and 70s, it was pretty popular. And then it fell out of favor because we realized, they realized then that the outcomes were pretty dismal in these patients, regardless of whether you took off bone. And then there was a resurgence of interest in this procedure from the 1990s to the 2000s plus. And the era of doubt occurred when we had the DECRA trial, which was April 2011. And that's a very, it's a very significant trial as that because it was the first large scale randomized controlled trial. This picture is a picture of a subdural hematoma um, and part of the dura has sort of been um, uh, torn through during the process of the craniotomy. Here's the temporalis muscle is in front and then the scalp is flapped over and that big uh, purplish thing is this big subdural hematoma. So the purpose of decompressive craniectomy is to really open the cranial vaults so that you can give more room for an expanding brain and expanding uh, swelling. There are three components. As we know, there's the brain, um, which we can get rid of mass lesions. We can do low bar resections. We can reduce infarct size uh, by taking out pieces of brain in order to reduce that component. There's blood. And by vasoconstricting through various means, we can reduce the amount of blood that's in the brain. And we have CSF, which also occupies that space in this rigid closed cavity, which we call the skull cavity. And ventricular drainage can help reduce that particular element here. So because this is a closed cavity, there's really no place for this brain to go once there's an increase in pressure. And this is the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, and this is the famous pressure volume curve, where we actually see that over time, uh, there's, a, there's a point in time where the brain can tolerate some added volume within the, the skull cavity, but as we get further and further with uh, crowding the structures of the brain, the brain is deformable to some degree, and so are the blood vessels and the CSF there comes a critical point where for any further change of volume, you get an asymptotic rise in the pressure. So that is really uh, what we call the pressure volume curve. And traditionally, you know, the, there's this inflection point, but the goal of decompressive craniectomy is to remove that rigid outer covering of the skull cavity so that the brain and the elements within can now expand further 
if there's more swelling and hopefully we can shift that pressure volume curve over to the right and we can flatten this more so that it would take even more swelling more uh, volume expansion of either uh, added blood or contusions that occur in the brain before we get terrible rises in ICP. And decompressive craniectomy has, the, has a significant uh, benefit in actually reducing intracranial pressure. It's reduced infarct volume, it's increasing brain perfusion, and very importantly, it actually reduces the need for intensive therapy. We have, uh, we can use uh, uh, pressors uh, and hyperosmolar therapy and getting a lot of CAT scans. But once you take the head off, in a large proportion of these patients, the ICP will become a better control. And therefore, you can relax a little bit more. You don't have to have all of this therapeutic intensity uh, in order to get the intracranial pressure under control. There is a technique to a decompressive craniectomy, and this uh, diagram uh, shows a hemispheric craniectomy, or what we call the, the hemicraniectomy. And this could be done on the right or the left, depending on what the pathology is. But what's important is that you really need to have uh, 12 to 15 centimeters of uh, anterior posterior um, diameter of this bone flap. And it has to be about 12 centimeters in the superior inferior dimension as well. And so this is an example of how if you're going to do a hemicraniectomy, you have to go large because what can happen is if you don't go large, you can get pinching of veins against the dura and the skull that can cause um, venous infarcts and contusions and, and uh, dead brain. So it's important to have very large craniectomies. Um, the uh, bifrontal craniectomy is um, described first by Kelberg and Prieto in 1971. And this is when we use bifrontal, it's actually bifrontotemporal, where we ligate the sinus and they cut the faults. And they found that uh, there was an 18% survival among the 73 cases that went there, underwent this procedure. However, um, they did have five excellent and four patients with some deficits. So regardless of the fact that these patients were very severely injured and on very poor survival rate, the ones who did survive actually did pretty well. So here's an example from the Atlas of Emergency Neurosurgery. Um, and this is an example of, sorry about that, um, where we have bifrontal temporal craniectomies, and this is the bone opening on the upper left-hand corner. On the lower left-hand corner, uh, we describe uh, cutting the uh, uh, sinus and ligating the sinus uh, at the anterior portion of the craniectomy so that you're getting as far anterior as possible to reduce uh, um, de um, impact upon the venous drainage of the brain. And then uh, you cut the faults, and then on the right panel, you see that a brain with a big contusion uh, is now expanding outward into, uh, you know, outward from the defect. So this is allowing a uh, brain to uh, come out and to relieve that pressure. It's the bifrontal is historically been recommended for patients with diffuse injury without any focal lesions where the brain is just swollen in general everywhere. However, uh, it also is good for patients who have bifrontal contusions, where you have a lot of contusions in the frontal lobes, and that's where you're targeting your craniectomy. Uh, but there could be some pitfalls to this. We don't know the impact of opening up and exposing both frontal lobes on cognitive recovery. So we don't know the answer to these things, but certainly this is an option. I think in the United States, we have a tendency to want to do hemicraniectomies as opposed to uh, bifrontal craniectomies because they're a little more time uh, consuming and hemicraniectomies are a little bit more straightforward. You're only exposing one side of the brain as opposed to 
bilateral frontal lobes. And um, uh, there's a, you can actually achieve a larger exposure with that, uh, with the hemicraniectomy. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you liked that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.